Here on the town square of our national life, we dedicate the United States Holocaust Museum and so bind one of the darkest lessons in history to the hopeful soul of America. If you don't have evidence to support the memory, the memory changes over time, it withers slowly. We have something here that is unique, that is effective. You have an unbelievable potential there. We need to be the voice the Jews didn't have, and we need to know when to use it. How can people get to such a point that they want to kill each other? How it was possible for so many people to participate. Innocent children, why were they not spared? Why did I survive? Why did people stand by and the world not come to our aid? What makes people do what they do? Can it happen again? What can I do in my life to make sure it doesn't happen again? Learning the lessons starts with asking the questions. Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Diane Saltzman, the Director of Constituency Engagement for the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, DC. We are pleased that you are joining us for this afternoon's program and want to especially acknowledge the Holocaust survivors who are here with us today. We extend our gratitude to our co-hosts, the Smithsonian and Smithsonian Magazine. I'd also like to welcome our digital audience joining us from around the globe. During the conversation, we encourage you to share your thoughts and ask questions using the hashtag AskWhy and hashtag USHMM. Today's program marks an historic anniversary, but we must pause to acknowledge that it takes place in the shadow of the deadly anti-Semitic attack at the Tree of Life Synagogue. We extend our sincerest and heartfelt sympathies to the families of the victims and to the entire Jewish community of Pittsburgh. Tomorrow marks the 80th anniversary of Kristallnacht. On November 9, 10, 1938, Nazi leaders unleashed a series of pogroms, organized attacks against the Jewish population in Germany, recently annexed Austria, and parts of Czechoslovakia, which came to be called Kristallnacht, the Night of Broken Glass. It was so named because of the shattered glass that littered the streets after the vandalism and destruction of Jewish-owned businesses, synagogues, and homes. Today, we reflect on the repercussions of this dangerous turning point in Holocaust history using the vivid observations of young diarists. Their accounts reveal the escalating persecution of Jews that followed the warning sign of Kristallnacht, marking the shift from anti-Semitic rhetoric and legislation to the widespread state-sponsored violence that would eventually culminate with the murder of six million Jewish men, women, and children. We are taking time to think about why we remember the events that led to the Holocaust and other global atrocities, why it's crucial to heed the warning signs of potential mass violence, and how understanding can help us make informed decisions about the future and shape a better world. The museum is here to remind us with bold confidence that memory has the capacity to transform, that the lessons of the Holocaust have the capacity to inspire, that each of us has the ability and responsibility to act. What you do, what we do, matters. And now it is my pleasure to introduce the Chief Operating Officer and Undersecretary for Finance and Administration at the Smithsonian, Albert Horvath. Thank you, Diane, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm so pleased to see all of you here and feel really privileged to join you. I'd like to thank the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum for hosting today's event. At the Smithsonian, we share this museum's vital mission of bringing the past to life so that we can better understand the present and help shape the future. Our new issue of Smithsonian Magazine did just that. The centerpiece is the diary of a young Jewish girl named Renia Spiegel, 
who was killed by the Nazis in Poland in 1942. Smithsonian Magazine translated Renia's diary into English and published a large portion of it for the first time here in America. Through the eyes of Renia and other writer, young writers of the time, you were able to understand and feel exactly what happened after Kristallnacht, the night of terror and pogroms that happened 80 years ago. Reading Renia's dramatic and moving diary, you realize in a direct and horrible way how life became increasingly dangerous and finally fatal for so many Jews throughout Europe and how quickly the world we think we know can completely change. When we published this special issue, we knew, we knew that anti-Semitic incidents were on the rise in Europe and in the United States, but we never expected our magazine to reach mailboxes the very same weekend as the worst attack against Jews in American history, the shooting at the Tree of Life Synagogue in the Squirrel Hill section of Pittsburgh that took the lives of 11 innocent people. Pittsburgh is my hometown. Some of my family live in Squirrel Hill and are members of a synagogue less than one mile from the Tree of Life. We all have to redouble our efforts to prevent such tragedies in the future and to never allow ourselves to accept these horrible acts as a fact of life. All of this underscores the importance of this afternoon's conversation. Kudos to the team at Smithsonian Magazine for your hard work on this special issue and for bringing Renia Spiegel's diary to light at this crucial time. I'm so proud to be your teammate. And once again, I'd like to thank the Holocaust Museum for partnering with us today so that we can learn from the young writers who chronicled the Holocaust. Now I'd like to turn the floor over to Ron Coleman, Chief Archivist at the Holocaust Museum, who will moderate the discussion. Ron. Thank you very much, and thank you all so much for joining us on this chilly November afternoon. Uh, my name is Ron Coleman. I am the Acting Chief Archivist here at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. Uh, and it is my privilege to uh, lead the discussion this afternoon about Diarus and the Holocaust. We will be taking your questions both in person here in the auditorium and at home. I'd like to welcome all of our people, all of our uh, visitors joining us uh, remotely through our live stream. We will be taking the questions at the end of the event, but please feel free to post your questions throughout the event. As Diane said, tomorrow marks the 80th anniversary of the Kristallnacht pogroms. Kristallnacht marked the moment when Nazi persecution of Jews moved from stripping them from rights and removing them from public life in Germany to violence and bloodshed. Kristallnacht was just one of the many warning signs of things to come during that pivotal year of 1938. Earlier that year, Germany had expanded its territory by annexing Austria and seizing parts of Czechoslovakia. The lack of a forceful response to these warning signs emboldened the Nazis as they prepared for war the following year. And the painfully passive response of the West to the news of Kristallnacht should serve as a challenge to all of us today when confronted with news of persecution and atrocities. While you are here, I do encourage you to take the time to visit the museum's new exhibit, Americans in the Holocaust, which explores the motives, pressures, and the fears that shaped Americans' responses to events like Kristallnacht. So this week is a particularly poignant time to consider just what these horrible events of Kristallnacht and afterwards meant for the everyday lives of those people directly targeted by the Nazis. The violent public nature of the attacks that night convinced many Jews that they had no future in Europe. And as we know, because we can look back on these events from the distance of 80 years, millions of them would be unable to escape. In diaries, though, we can explore how these events were experienced at the time and in real time. We can read the private words of eyewitnesses and those who would become survivors and victims who confided their hopes and fears as Nazi persecution grew and their lives changed dramatically. It's safe to say that most young people, even today, still first learn about the Holocaust for the first time through the words of Anne Frank, but she's not the only young person who kept diaries during this time period. The museum has more than 220 diaries in our collection from people ranging uh, young teenagers up to people into their 70s. And we are working to make these diaries more accessible and easier to read than ever. By next summer, all of the museum's diaries should be available through our website. 
And we, thanks to a successful Save Their Stories Kickstarter campaign, and thank you to everybody here who, who supported that, we will be translating 13 of those diaries uh, from more than eight different languages into English. Most of them will be available in English for the very first time. This will allow far more people to encounter the intimate, deeply personal narratives that capture experiences as they are lived, from the first days of Nazi brutality through to the final moments. Today, we are privileged to be joined by three distinguished panelists, and we'll have a conversation about one very special diary in particular, um, and the potential of diaries to reveal new aspects of Holocaust history and remind us of the relevance of the Holocaust today. Uh, so, from your left, uh, please welcome Alexandra Zapruder. She is the author of Salvage Pages, Young Writers, Diaries of the Holocaust. And she's currently the guest curator for a new exhibit called And Still I Write, Young Diarists on War and Genocide, which is scheduled to open next year at Holocaust Museum Houston. Next to her is Alexandra Bellock, niece of the diarist Renya Spiegel. And next to me is Renya's sister, Elizabeth Bellock. So, Elizabeth, welcome. Nice to see. Take your mic. <laughs> I better get this. So okay. we certainly want to know about your sister and her story, but we also really want to know about you. Can you tell us about you? Where are you from? What was your early childhood like? Well, I was born as Ariana, and I lived on a Romanian border where I was born in the estate of my father. And I was young, and my mother thought I was... I uh, had talent for speaking and reciting poetry. And so she started with me to uh, see, we went to town of Lvov where I was on the radio. And I was only five years old. And I actually didn't remember till we found some pictures showing me that because after I came to the United States, I forgot about my career. But then my mom took me to Warsaw, and I was in Cyrulik Warszawski, and I was called the Polish Shirley Temple. <laughs> I was also, I didn't have curly hair, I had straight hair, but I admired her movies, and I was in the movie called Gehenna. And after that, I also recited poetry. There was a nightclub called the Cyrulik Warszawski, and I was on the stage, I recited a lot of poems, and I knew the two poem, poet, men who wrote the poetry. One was Julian Tuvim, and one was Jan Brechwa. And I was invited to their home because they liked the way I spoke. So my life was very nice, and I was a movie star, and I was only eight years old, and unfortunately, in 1939, the war came, and I never knew anything about it, and I never saw myself in the movie, but my mom saved a little strip of paper, and in it, it said that I was in two movies, Gehenna and Granica, and we met a very nice Polish man, Mr. Tomasz Majerski, and he found the movie. And after 80 years, I saw myself for the first time in the movies. But that didn't last very long, because in 1939, the war came, and I was stuck on the Russian side of Poland, because Poland was divided in 39. My mother was stuck in Warsaw. I was with my grandparents and my sister. Renya, who started to write the diary. So yes, tell Nine, us about Renya. So she was, she was older than you, right? She was six years older than I. Mm -hmm. So since my mom wasn't there, she was sort of like a surrogate mother because my grandparents are a bit old. And in the old days, you know, when somebody was 65, they were really old. <laughs> and here I am getting old, and I'm still here. So there you are. <laughs> so that was my life as a child. And then we went to a Russian school. I had to learn Russian, but my sister was much older, and she went to gymnasium. She went to gymnasium, and my mom also went to the same one 
but many years before. Do you remember your sister keeping a diary? Do you remember the diary? No, I actually, my diary of my sister was hidden. I've never seen the diary to the young man after all the camps, her boyfriend, who was in many camps, Zygmunt Schwarze. He brought, found my mom in New York City. I have no idea how he found her. I don't know how the diary was saved, but there was the diary. But you know, because it was very hard for me to read it, I actually never really read the diary, except now that it was published in the Smithsonian, I have read some excerpts and I can understand it. I tried to translate it. My Polish is quite good, but unfortunately I couldn't do it. It's too emotional for me. But we found some people who translate the diary. So, so Alexander, can you hear me or should I talk louder? <laughs> good, thank you. So, Alexander, what did you know about your, your aunt growing up? Did you know about the diary as a, as a child? Um, well, first, I, I just wanted to uh, say it's an honor to be here at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. Um, I have to pinch myself to think that something that started as a small personal project has morphed into something bigger and more meaningful and necessary. Um, after the deplorable events that transpired in Pittsburgh, I feel that my, my aunt's diary uh, warns us all of the depravity inspired by anti-Semitism and hatred. And I do want to thank a few people who made this event possible. Um, I want to thank our friends at the Smithsonian, the editor-in-chief, Michael Caruso, who was captivated by Renya's story. And his passion for the diary culminated in this month's uh, cover of the Smithsonian Magazine and to Jenny Gritz Rothenberg, who had the arduous assignment of um, editing 15,000 words of a 70,000 word diary. And while she was working on the diary, she, she fell under Renya's spell, as many have before, and many will continue to do so. I'd like to thank Robin Schulman, the writer. Um, she had a very difficult task of having to follow very detailed uh, events and dates in very juicy Polish names, so that was that was a difficult task for her. Um, and Claire Rosen, who's here, the photographer, who's an artistic wonderkind and really captured my mother and the artifacts in this old world charm. Uh, I'd like to sincerely thank the uh, Holocaust Museum for uh, working with the Smithsonian to host today's event, to Alexandra Zapruder for her, the literary talent that she is and to bring her expertise on diaries of the Holocaust and to you, Ron, for moderating. And I wanna thank all of you for being here, um, especially my nephews who are playing hooky today, but their parents, my brother Andrew and sister-in-law Susan, felt that this was an important learning experience, which it is. Uh, your presence here today is a testament to not only keeping the memory of Renya and the Holocaust alive and relevant, but to continue to fight against xenophobia and racism and anti-Semitism as they rear their ugly heads again. You know, it's our job to bear witness and um, to give a voice to those who've been abandoned and victimized and uh, forgotten. So I also want to thank Tomasz Magierski because his efforts to bring this diary to light were nothing short of Herculean. He was able to publish the diary in Polish, find a translator to not just translate the diary, but very intricate poems he traveled extensively, he unearthed uh, photos and, and movies about my mother and Renya, and um, he traveled extensively and worked tirelessly and researched meticulously to bring the diary to life. He is nothing short of a mensch. Um, and I also uh, would like to thank Moya Mamusha, <laughs> who traveled here today after losing her husband very recently. Only and three months. And uh, 
but when I was married 53 years. She may have been reluctant to tell her story and unearth painful memories and dark secrets, but she felt that she needed to recognize her sister's talent and uh, keep her legacy alive, a sister who often acted like a mother figure. So. so. <laughs> So, Alexander, you're an expert in Holocaust diaries, writ large. Um, why are we so drawn to diaries as a, as a form? So, a minor correction, really young writers' diaries. Um, it's more my area, although there are many diaries by adults that are extraordinary and very, very well worth reading. You know, I think diaries are, are very special um, kinds of primary sources because they tend to really capture the nuances and the complexity of day-to-day -day life, the subtlety, the details that get lost um, in memory or in the historical record. And so when you read a diary, you are able to sort of enter into the life, the lived life of the writer as events are unfolding without a knowledge of the outcome. Oftentimes, with certain kinds of very significant limitations. You know, people certainly writing in genocide don't have a complete picture of what is happening around them or don't have complete knowledge or understanding of where they fit in a, in a larger story. And so in some ways, although that's a limitation, it also is, it opens one's eyes, I think, to, to what it's, you know, what that perspective is, living through it. Um, I mean, there are many other things I could say. I fell in love with diaries in the early 1990s here um, on the founding staff of this museum working on Daniel's story, and never, that's my first and most lasting literary love, I think, um, because of how much richness there is in them. And, and oh, the one other thing I should say, which I think is so true for Renia's diary, is that um, the voice of the writer is, is captured on the page. And when you read a diary and then you read another diary and another diary, you realize what we all know, of course, about ourselves and about our, our own time, that we have completely unique voices, completely unique perspectives, a totally unique way of thinking about the world and, and expressing our lives as we live them. And that uniqueness is captured um, in a diary in a very special way. And when that life is extinguished, in particular under unjust circumstances and before um, its time, it becomes even more precious, I think. So one of the, um, so Rainia began keeping her diary in January 1939. So just a few months after Kristallnacht, although the family lived on the other side of Poland from Germany, so did not experience Kristallnacht firsthand. But from the very early on in the diary, I'm struck by how um, she was aware of sort of a drumbeat com uh, of, of threatening um, events to the east. Um, Alexander, would you mind reading um, a couple of excerpts from the very early parts of, of Renya's diary for us? I have no real home, but Hitler took over Austria, then Czechoslovakia, and who knows what he'll do next. In a way, he's affecting my life too. This is, so one of the things to, to, to remember here is the date. This is still several months before the Nazi invasion of Poland, before the Soviet annexation of invasion from, from the East. Um, and yet, you, you get the very clear sense from her diary that even though it reflects everyday life, that there's a sense of um, foreboding that is, is starting to encroach upon her everyday life. And so, Alex, Alexandra, from working with, with especially young people's diaries, um, one of the things that strikes me about reading Renia's diary is just how normal it is. You, you, you become enchanted by her, 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 her growing love interests and, and her, her complaining about her teachers and her talking about her friends. And, and then every once in a while you get a sense that of, of history sort of intruding itself on the daily life. How common, especially in young people's diaries, do, do diaries become sort of places of refuge for personal life, or do they become places of um, ang records of anxieties? How common is this everyday experience? So there are so many Holocaust-era diaries by teens that have surfaced that it's hard to generalize. But 
but this kind of um, back and forth between the private life of the writer and the, especially the adolescent writer, and Renia's diary, I think, is so um, remarkable in this blossoming, this love affair, and um, awakening that is happening in her um, as a young girl, juxtaposed with the encroaching, you know, political conflict and its effect on herself and her family. It's not unusual, um, but it's very pronounced in her diary that is in a way that is, is, is fascinating. And, you know, it really also depends on, um, of course, it depends on the diarist and what their sort of focus was, but also when the diaries were written. You know, earlier diaries tend to have more of that back and forth. Diaries written later, 1943, 1944, into 1945, there is no other life other than the genocide that is taking place around them or the persecution that these young people were experiencing. So, or for example, diaries that were written over long periods of time in the ghetto. You know, there might be the occasional reprieve of various kinds, intellectual life, social life, um, romance, but the, con the, the context is, presses in, I think, on these writers. So it, it, it really depends on the person. And that certainly shows up in Renya's diary, too, as her life becomes more and more constrained into the ghettos. She still has a very rich sort of experience she's trying to hold on to of being a teenager falling in love, and yet the very next sentence will be, it is Hitler's birthday and I want to scream into the void. Um, but the, back to the early, you commented that some of the early um, entries, uh, early diaries tend to be um, a bit more personal and uh, uh, not as, as engaged with the larger. Uh, right. I mean, I think because there was still a life to live there. And, you know, I think one of the things that um, that is fascinating is to see and, and heartbreaking is to see how exactly, as you said, how those how the world gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And, you know, Renia's diary, at least the parts that I've read, I mean, she certainly there's much more than just the the sort of the early part of the diary when she sounds very much like a typical teen of the time, you know, really. And then she falls in love and so much of the entries are about this love affair and that's not that uncommon, but many of them are a little more chaste maybe. <laughs> she's quite, not explicit, but quite, you know, she's confiding in her diary, you know, of this, this quite passionate love affair that she's having. Um, I think, that is something that, I, the other thing that I would say about her diary is that it also, like any diary of this period, creates a very serious and provides a very serious historical record of what was happening. And she was quite a literary writer, a beautiful writer with a, a beautiful voice. She had, you know, there are many times when I was reading the diary when I was really, um, you know, quite taken with um, how how eloquent she was in writing. So there's always something unique about each diary, and yet, of course, there are ways in which any one of these diaries can be put in a larger context, and you can find overlapping themes and topics or trends, um, which doesn't detract from that which is singular about her work. So we want to hear more from Renia's words. Um, she was even though in her early entries was very much in her, her, her daily life and trying to capture and confide, she was also aware of events that were going around. Alexandra, would you mind reading the next entry? You don't even know that the Russians have signed a treaty with the Germans. You don't know that people are stockpiling food, that everybody's on the alert, waiting for war. When I was saying goodbye to Mama, I hugged her hard. I wanted to tell her everything with that silent hug. I wanted to take her soul and leave her my own, because when? And this is August 25th, 1939. And then, in, then from an entry a couple of, um, just a few months later. 15 when she's yes. writing. So she's only 15 when she's writing this. Uh, there's another entry from just a couple of months later, a short one. Too. That's why I miss the old days when mama was still with me, when I had my own home, when there was peace in the world, when everything was blue, bright, serene. And that's November 1st, 1939. Elizabeth, uh, Renya writes with such love for your mother. Um, you were separated from your mother at this time, well, we, right? we couldn't get could together. Speak to the mic. Oh. <laughs> uh, well, the Germans were on the other side. We were cut off on the Russian side. And for 
you know, people thought maybe the war will be over in a few weeks instead of extended, so nobody could talk to each other, write to each other. We didn't even know my mother was alive. So once she said so long, we, it was vacation time, we stayed with the grandparents. She really didn't know what, you know, when she would see my mom. And of course it was very painful, very painful to us. We had no mother. And we didn't know what happened with my dad. So it was very difficult. Do you remember much? Um, do you remember uh, the, any daily persecutions, any feeling fear at this time period? At that time, we were only feared war because, you know, there was shooting and we didn't know who was coming. Was it the Russians? The Germans came for a little bit. Then they retrieved. They divided the, 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 the there was a river Sun. They divided the city into two. One side was Russian, the other side was German, so we were petrified. Who knew what was going on? Unless somebody lives in a war, it's very difficult to figure it out. It's a very serious situation, but my sister was so aware of everything. I was young, so, you know, I couldn't figure it out myself, but my sister did. Well, and that's, again, one of the value for me, as a, as a sort of literary experience of reading one of the value of diaries like Renya's is, and she is so aware in capturing that experience. If she was upset, she would always write a poem. There are 60 poems in her diary. She could express it in a poem, and it's so deep. Some of the poems are beautiful, and they express the story, which is also fascinating. Alexandra, you mentioned themes that start to come out. Are there themes around the early sort of warning signs or early um, experiences of news of, not, of brutality? There are, I mean, there are so many themes. And in fact, the, the thing that I was thinking about um, just now when you were speaking, Elizabeth, is about what is particular to adolescent writers, young writers. You know, adult diarists, of course, documented in very fulsome ways the circumstances what, of what they experienced during the war and during the Holocaust. But, you know, adult identities are more or less fixed at a certain point. You, you sort of, you, hopefully you're always growing in some way, but adolescents are, by definition, in this time where their whole process of being, and I say this having a 13-year-old daughter, is about figuring out who they are, what to accept, what to reject, what to take from their nationality, their religion, their family, you know, and, and so that development doesn't not happen just because it's the war or not happen just because it's the Holocaust. It's still happening. But in this context, it's happening against the backdrop, not only of upheaval and conflict, but of a genocide that targeted reduced people's existence to one element of their identity, which was their Jewishness. And so, you know, I'm so struck hearing these entries that, that you've been reading, this, um, the attachment to your mother. She's still a little girl, I mean, she's 15 years old or 16 years old, she needs her mother to guide her and to help her grow up and she doesn't have that. And there's something, that is something that you see, of course, in diaries from this period, young people who are separated from their parents and of course there are many of them who were separated from their parents who are having to grow up and grapple with the process of coming of age in a time of conflict without the kinds of, of teaching and learning and support that every child needs. So for teenagers in particular, um, children and teenagers, I think there are layers upon layers upon layers to excavate in terms of the meaning of these diaries and what they really tell us, not only about the Holocaust itself, not only about the life of the writer, but about the life of young people and what they endure and what they live and how they come of age. It's very, very rich and complicated material, I think. And that uh sort of everyday normal um, development in, in an extraordinary time, um, uh, that's one of the things that makes diaries so useful in education. We use diaries through many of our, our, our teacher programs here, and I know you've worked with education uh, um, uh, organizations elsewhere that use diaries. Diaries are some, uh, often the, uh, some of the most powerful way of generating empathy. Um, and that's uh, something that we find 
as we do educational programs with diaries um, uh, also. And you mentioned the sort of having this normal life while being singled out for one aspect of your of your life. And certainly Rainia talks about that in her diary of having to start where the yellow star and what that means to be tomorrow I will be a different person than I am now outwardly, even though internally I am the same. Mm. So Elizabeth, how did you escape Poland? What's that? How did you escape Poland? Uh, you mean how I got to my mom? Yes. Well, um, I had a very good girlfriend. Her name was Jitka Leszczyńska. She was Christian, very good Catholic. And she was my very dear friend, and I used to play with her. And so once, you know, we lived a year without being in the ghetto with my grandparents, but then came uh, the resolution that they decided everybody had to go to the ghetto and they're gonna close it. So we were there with my sister, and during the year, we, the Jews could not go to school. The Jews could not go to school under the Germans. They did go to school under the Russians. So we just hung around, my sister worked, and I was playing with Jitka, she was my friend. So my friend, Zygmunt, somehow, I don't know really how, got, smuggled me out of the ghetto. And I only had a little coat, a little dress, and a small little, uh, like a lunchbox that my grandpa put $20 gold money into it. And uh, he said, you know, you have to sell it or whatever. One day you'll need it. That's all I came out with. And he took me to the house of Jitka, where I spent a whole week there. And then he took me by hand and said, uh, and took me to the railroad station as his child. And you know, it was death penalty for those people. But he decided that I had to find a home or find my mom. And he took me on the train from Przemysl, and they had to change in Krakow, there was Gestapo with all the dogs and everything. You can imagine how scared I might have been. And he held me close by my hand and said, this is my child. And I went to Warsaw. And it was the first time in two years that I saw my mom. And there was a man at the railroad station, and he said to Mr. Leszczynski, I think you're carrying a Jewish child. He said, if you say anything, I'll kill you. The man ran away. Thank God. <laughs> and so here I am to tell you the story. I went to friends, and my mom came. And you can imagine how everybody cried, <laughs> because my mom was there. Mr. Leszczynski, then he said, now I leave you with your mom, and he left. So I've read in some of the articles about the diary that um, your mother live, lived as Catholic the rest of her life. That's how she had been hiding. When yes. did you, um, well, for either of you, when did so you start to... So when we went to that family, the, fam the lady who was married to this Polish man was also Jewish descent. And she married this Paul. She was married to a Jewish man before, and this was her second marriage. So they took, they had a priest who was very nice. My mother did all his German uh, correspondence for the church for free. And uh, he baptized me immediately and shoved me into some convent. <coughs> now, I didn't know much about the Catholic religion, but remember, I was a movie star. I played my role. <laughs> so I did the best I could at first, not knowing what I was doing. But somehow, slowly, you know, it came to me easy. And that's how I survived, being a Catholic, going to church. And then my mom took, was able to take me to the hotel where she was assistant director. Hotel was 300 rooms, German officers lived there. 
and we lived there on the German guards. And my mom did all the work for the hotel in German because the vice president, who was Volksdeutsch, which means he was partly German, he couldn't do it. But my mom was educated at the university in Vienna. Her German was impeccable, and that's how we survived that. So how did Renia's diary come to you? How did you? Well, Sigmund Schwarzer, who became a doctor in Heidelberg, he was. Sigmund, who was her, the, my, the, my the love, boyfriend. Her boyfriend. And he was in so many camps. His son visited all the camps in Poland that he was in, and there were quite a few. He was very handsome, had green eyes, dark curly hair, mm -hmm. gorgeous. <laughs> and he somehow found my mom. Somebody saved the diary. We're really not sure who saved the diary, but they saved the diary, and he brought it to my mom in the United States. Now, I don't know even how he found my mother, but he did. And so my mother kept the diary. I'm not sure she read it. It's very difficult to lose a child, I'm sure all of you know, and so she had a hard time. But my daughter decided that the diary had a great meaning because whoever writes the diary, and she had a beautiful Polish, the writer, because my grandma sent her to a special Polish professor who really taught her Polish even more than the school. And so she wrote the diary and Zygmunt found my mom. My daughter thought, well, let's see what's in it. And we started it. So here we are, telling you the story. Alexander, what does it mean to you and to your family to be sharing this so widely now? And why now? Um, I have mixed feelings about sharing it, I think. After I find, and my name is Alexandra Renata, so I was named after this special woman that I was never able to meet, unfortunately, because of her brutal demise. But um, I was always curious about her and my heritage and my past and why we had no extended family. And I thought, well, maybe I'll discover more in the diary. But I don't speak Polish. <laughs> So, uh, thanks, Mom. They so I <laughs> babysitters didn't teach the Polish. They were Polish. <laughs> so I, I found someone to translate the diary in a very rudimentary fashion. But just from the entries I was able to read, I, I grasped the, the depth and breadth and maturity of this intelligent soul. Uh, I mean, she makes references to German philosophers like Heinrich, Heine and composers such as Mahler and uh, famous poets. And, you know, the, the selfish part was, well, I, I want to learn more about my heritage. So let me learn about what sh this diary is and who, who I am. And, and then I felt guilty because the first entries of the diary are her explaining that this is some a place that she can confide in and it will be her private space and no one will, you know, she needed a confidant because she didn't have her mother figure around and she had these older grandparents and um, she didn't really have a place to express her true feelings. So by sharing it, I felt it was important, especially with, you know, um, you know, Holocaust survivors are leaving us and uh, that fact with the rise of anti-Semitism in the world reminds us that we have to work even harder as second, third generations to ensure that the lessons of the Holocaust continue to guide us. I love that you brought up this, this thing about feeling guilty. <clears throat> I mean, it comes with the <laughs> DNA, right? <laughs> but, um, but in this particular area, um, you know, I think there is always this push and pull of reading the private records of, of people who use their diaries as a place to confide and tell, not all writers did, some writers were very, intended their diaries to be public, 
testimonies and, t and, and a record of what they endured um, for a wider audience. But this is something that I so relate to, having read so many writings and thinking to myself over the years, you know, is this what the writer would want? What do we owe to the memory of the writer? What do we owe to history? What do we owe to the present? You know, how do you juggle those things? And there are no easy answers. Um, to those questions, although in my own life I've, of course, come to believe that, you know, these, no, no one wants to be forgotten. Nobody, we all want to believe that it mattered that we lived in this world and that we um, contributed something to it. And for those people whose lives are taken from them um, in such a brutal and unjust way, and especially so young, to be able to preserve that memory and share it, I think is, a, is an act of, of really profound humanity. I think it, in my mind anyway, it supersedes the question of, um, of privacy, ex unless there is something specific in the diary that you, know, you could imagine would be, would be hurtful to someone or embarrassing, but, but that's usually not the case, I think. So Rainia kept her diary for more than three years. It's more than 700 pages of, of writings and poetry and, and, and other she insights. I never yeah. saw it. <laughs> and she hid she 700 hid pages somewhere. from her family. Um, her last entries are from July of 1942. Um, she documents how her life had become increasingly constricted. Um, Alexander, would you mind reading? This is the very last entry that Rainia wrote in her diary. My dear diary, my good beloved friend, we've gone through such terrible times together and now the worst moment is upon us. I could be afraid now, but the one who didn't leave us then will help us today too. He'll save us. Hear, O oh Israel, save us, help us. You've kept me safe from bullets and bombs, from grenades, help me survive. And you, my dear mama, pray for us today, pray hard. Think about us and may your thoughts be blessed. Mama, my dearest one and only, such terrible times are coming. I love you with all my heart, I love you. We will be together again. God protect us all, and Zygmunt and my grandparents and Ariana. God, into your hands I commit myself. You will help me, Bulush and God. We called my mom Bulushta, was our name for her. What became of Renya? What happened to her? To who? What happened to your sister? So, uh, uh, Zygmunt took her and his parents, his father was also a doctor, and his mother went to school with my mother, gymnasium, and he hid them somewhere in the garret. I was with Mr. Lischinski. I didn't know anything about it. And somebody ratted on them. I had good friends. Some people were not good. And they ratted on them and shot them. We don't know how they were shot or where they were buried, but they were gone. So most diaries from the Holocaust, most diaries of victims of the Holocaust don't actually include the end of the story because the diary writer um, disappears or is known to have been killed. Renya's diary is a bit different because when he Zygmunt. put them... Zygmunt yes. is the one who writes the few words in the diary last, and he said the three shots were the dearest people in my life, and they're gone. That's how I found out how my sister died. In fact, that is the very last entry that Zygmunt wrote in 1942, and it reads, three shots, three lives lost. It happened last night at 10.30 p.m. Fate decided to take my dearest ones away from me. My life is over. All I can hear are shots, shots, shots. My dearest Renusia, the last chapter of your diary is complete. When we study the Holocaust, it's, uh, we often become focused on how people died, on how people were killed, the actions that led up to their deaths. One thing about diaries is that they allow us to 
remind ourselves of how people lived. With that in mind, I want to make sure that the last words we hear today are actually Renya's words. So just a few weeks before she was killed, Renya wrote one of her many poems. Um, it was particularly beautiful, uh, particularly resonant to me. I wonder if, Alexander, if you wouldn't mind reading an excerpt of that poem. Think, tomorrow we might not be. A cold steel knife will slide between us, you see. But today there is still time for life. Today you are alive. There is still time to survive. Thank you, Alex. Thank you all for joining us today. So we will be taking questions in just a moment, but before we do, I want to take a moment to thank all three of you. I want to thank you for your expertise. Thank you for your time. And most of all, thank you for sharing your story and the story that's And we that's thank you all for coming. <laughs> So we're going to open up the floor for questions, both um, here in, in person, and my colleagues have been collecting questions that have come um, from our online. Uh, we do have two microphones. Please come to the, to the mics. Uh, you can feel free to line up to ask your questions. A uh, couple reminders. Uh, please keep your questions short um, and respectful. And also, please keep them as questions. Uh, if we get a sense that you may be making more of a statement than a question, we may move on. So uh, I believe my colleague has some, some uh, questions that have come in through the website. Thank you for the powerful program. We have three questions that came in from Facebook. The first is, does the museum collect diaries from contemporary genocides, such as Bosnia, Rwanda, and Burma? The second one is, are there diaries by non-Jewish people in World War II? And the third question is, how can these diaries be used by young people to tell their stories today? Sure. So um, I'll answer the first question, at least a bit from the museum's perspective. So our mandate is to um, rescue the evidence of the Holocaust, to um, collect, preserve, and make available uh, collections about the Holocaust specifically. So to that end, we don't collect uh, primary materials from, like diaries and things from other uh, um, genocides. We do collect books about other genocides and, and, and sort of comparative genocides, first person accounts from other genocides in our library. Um, but there are, genocides, there are diaries that are from others. Alexandra, I know you've done some research. So I'll try to, this is a, this is a, there could be a whole other session on, on this topic. Um, so I recently, thanks to Deborah Rosenberg, my editor at Smithsonian Magazine, who in, invited me to contribute an article to this um, wonderful issue about Rhenia. Um, I was able to write in this, this article about quite a number of other diaries that have surfaced um, several from Sarajevo during the siege. Some of you may know the well-known diary of Zlata Filipovic. Um, there's another one that is less known. And then um, a diary which was really kept actually as a blog um, by a teenage girl in Iraq um, under the occupation and by a boy um, in Syria under ISIS. So. There are, um, there are diaries by, and I'm sure there are many, many more out there that I don't know about, um, but there, it's a fascinating um, sort of way of, of extending this question about young people writing in war and genocide and how the themes that run through the Holocaust era diaries and how they are changed um, in more contemporary genocides. There are, of course, also diaries by non-Jews living through World War II. Um, either as victims of the Germans by virtue of identity, or for example, there's a diary of a girl named Lena Mukina who wrote um, in Leningrad during the siege, and it's an extraordinary diary documenting um, the starvation and suffering of the inhabitants of the city, and another, several diaries written by Japanese boys um, in Japanese, um, Japanese American boys in Japanese, in Japanese internment camps here in the US. So all of these, I think, are so important in that they expand our perspective and they help us draw connections between different periods of time. Um, there was one other question about how these diaries 
can be used in the present day, right? Um, so I'm curating this exhibition at Holocaust Museum Houston, which is about Holocaust era diaries of teenagers and more contemporary ones. And one of the things that we're thinking a lot about is how can these diaries be used with, uh, particularly with vulnerable populations today? Young people who, for example, are recently arrived um, migrants, um, recently arrived immigrants to this country, or um, young people who are incarcerated as young people. Um, young people who are incarcerated as young people. <laughs> that didn't come out right. Um, young people, survivors in Sudan, for example, and Rwanda from other genocides. So how can we use these diaries to inspire young people to write their accounts today? And as a person who's been teaching this material for a long time, some of the most extraordinary experiences I've had have been with these populations. In a school, for example, here, Cardozo High School, in ESL classes with kids who are pre predominantly from Guatemala, Honduras, or El Salvador, all of whom are learning English who just came here, who have their own stories about these long journeys to come here and the terror that they fled and the hostility that they have been met with here in America. And so for them, reading these diaries, they're shocked um, to find so much resonance and they are inspired to believe that they have something um, to say that can contribute to the historical record. So I hope more and more and more will be done with this. And just to, to comment on the breadth of diaries that are available and continue to become available, we are continuing to collect, um, we collect more than 400 collections, original paper uh, and artifact collections a year here at the museum. And many of them do include original diaries. Just, just this week, we've, we've acquired a, a very interesting one. Um, those so you need to call me every time. Okay. <laughs> uh, so as the, I mentioned that we have more than 200 diaries in our collection. That's just the original paper diaries that we have. We also have, I, I would probably say, thousands of diaries in probably more than two dozen, three dozen languages that we have copies of from other archives. So we work with institutions around the world to make copies of materials and bring them back for researchers. And they cover the breadth of, of experience. We have diaries from um, a non-Jewish uh, woman in Budapest uh, about five years ago. This uh, diary was donated by Maria Mahdi. And in the, dex in the text, she describes how she decided to rescue a young Jewish boy. And we realized that the young Jewish boy was still alive, and we reached out to him, and she has been recognized by Yavashem as a righteous among the nations. We also have, for example, we could talk for hours with the diaries, but we have, for example, a diary of a, of a um, uh, Hispanic, uh, Mexican-American um, soldier who had been uh, named Anthony Acevedo, who had been uh, taken as a prisoner of war and singled out because of his sort of non-Aryan heritage along with Jews and others in a, in a particular concentration camp. And he keeps detailed notes about his, his experiences and the fate of others around him. So yes, the breadth of the experiences in our collection, and this is one of the things that we are very excited about, being able to make the diary as much more accessible through our website, is we want people to get a sense of the breadth of this, of the richness of this type of, of, of experience. We have a question over here. Oh, thank you. Can you can you hear me? Yes. I'm only five foot two, so I can't always reach stuff. <laughs> um, the question I have comes from my mother's experience. She was 11 in Christ and when Kristallnacht hit in Vienna, and then the whole family had to eventually move on to several countries to survive. My question is, what happened to them was that her mother, when they left for Belgium, couldn't cope with anything. So what happened, it goes to your point about young people, is that she, and to some extent her brother, they were the resilient ones. They took over. And that message of resilience is what I'm wondering if you see in the other diaries, which would be a message to the people you're dealing with, that these are people who've had to deal with the unexpected, and they had to cope, and things didn't work out the way they had hoped. But that ability to adapt is really a gift if I may personally add, to the world we're living in today where things are frequently changing and the ability of this adaptation and resilience seems to me is the gift that some of these young people have given. And 
is there anything in the other diaries that hints at that that can then be used? I mean, I think certainly there is ample evidence of resilience um, among young writers um, and other things that are perhaps characteristic of young people, the ability to compartmentalize, the ability to live fully and joyfully even as um, there is tremendous suffering um, and a kind of optimism in some cases that is elusive for adults. Um, I think the best thing that diaries can do is a teaching tool beyond opening up the nuances and the complexity of this history. That's the thing that is most powerful, I think, is to, is again, to reiterate the same point that I made earlier, the fullness of, of, of the historical past and its complexity, but also to, to create empathy. And I think young people, you know, in the many years that I've spent teaching this material to teachers and to students, you know, Young people in the present are often taken, back, taken aback when they read these diaries because this is, this is a kind of hardship and a kind of struggle for survival that can, can bring enormous perspective to some audiences and to other readers um, can resonate very deeply with the kind of personal hardship that they're enduring, whether it's social, whether it has to do with racism or um, anti-immigrant bias or any, or whether it's um, simply the, the the struggle of growing up in, in a difficult situation. So yes, I think there's an enormous amount of potential there. And, and empathy is something that is in distressingly short supply Indeed. today. Indeed. We have a question from this. Thank you. Uh, I have two brief questions for Rania's uh, sister, uh, Elizabeth. Yes, is that right? Uh, one is, do you, do you remember your, your father, I think Bernard, uh, can you tell us anything you might remember of what was he like, what became of him? The, the other question is, uh, I think many of us are taken by the, the final words of the diary, uh, that is, uh, some of them are the final words, the hero Israel save us, that's the beginning of the Shema, which is addressing all Jews, but it, in this abbreviated version at that part of the diary, it seems to be asking fellow Jews to save them. And, was, was your sister religious? What do you think she was thinking when she began the Shema and formulated in that context? Thank you. No, I don't know. My sister believed, my sister believed deeply in God. She was that way religious. She believed that God would save us. <clears throat> what happened to my father, you know as well as I do. I have no idea. We never knew what happened to my father. And my daughter tried to find out about the relatives, but unless you know the date of birth or where they were born, she was never able to find out. I have no idea what happened to my dad. I know he was in a ghetto, supposedly in Horodenka, and another cousin of mine, Lila. But what happened to them, I don't know. It's an unfortunate fact of researching, trying to help people trace um, relatives and loved ones, is that especially in eastern Poland and to Ukraine and Belarus, there are, is no documentation, depending on how, the, how the, the communities were often killed entirely. So even with birth dates and details that we may not, but we, we are continuing to, to acquire and build more, more records, and so I'll follow up. I'll offer to follow up and see if we can find, hopefully, Maybe some answers. We'll find and let you know. <laughs> Question here? So you mentioned the final entry was Sigmund, her boyfriend. Is that, how did it get from him, that final entry? Who, when you said who gave you the diary many years later, they came to the United States. Was that a relationship to the same Sigmund, who you got the diary from? That was the same segment, right? Same segment, yeah. Same. So this man who was the last entry, he held on to, to all those years searching for you and gave it to you? Can you share with us what his, the impact that must have had on his life, this diary and? No, you couldn't be in camps and keep a diary. There was no way anybody could keep anything. 
No, I oh, meant the impact no of your one, sister's no diary. No one in the camps could keep anything. But the diary, he, he, the diary yeah. must have been hidden by someone yeah. and bring, brought it to Zygmunt okay. the, during the war or, a, of course, after the war. But he, so Zygmunt gave Zygmunt you, gave your family, the diary mom, in, the, in diary. the 50s. And in the, the Smithsonian article, it comments on just how meaningful the diary was. He make a, made a copy of it for himself. He made it for himself, supposedly had a shrine in his basement. And when I went to the house, he had my sister's picture, which was just shown here in a little hat or whatever. And, you know, he just lost my sister, but his wife, I guess, didn't like to see me too much to remind him of his past girlfriend. So, but he was kind enough to find my mom and give it to her, which was great. But, you know, my mom was very emotional about it. She loved my sister as much as she loved her. And when she lost, I don't think she could possibly read it. I could never read it. It gives me too much, you know, emotion and sickness. I just can't think how it all was. Reminds you of the bad years, you know. Right. It's very difficult to think about it. Thank you. I was just going to say that the, the journey of these diaries from either the writers or from their loved ones to into the hands of <coughs> their relatives or to, to archives is often a very circuitous and surprising one. And there are often big gaps in time where, you know, a diary kind of surfaces after a certain number of years and it's not, you know, sometimes people found diaries of teenagers and, you know, one in a ditch outside or in a, one was found in a pile of paper trash in a factory, I mean, in abandoned apartment buildings and, and people would hold on to them. Sometimes for one of the most extraordinary diaries of this period was written by an anonymous boy in four languages um, in Lodge Ghetto, and that diary was found by a stranger, and he held onto it for 25 years before he donated it to Yad Vashem. So I think, you know, there is a sense that these are precious records, and that they are, are you know, that they, they need to be preserved, but sometimes it takes a long time for them to find the right home. I think we have time for one more question. Oh, well then. Jean Dobry Babcha. That's my son, Andrew. Um, so I have a comment and a gratitude and a question. Okay. <clears throat> and so the gratitude is thank you, you know, for bringing this to light and for working on it. And thank you, Tomas. Dziękuję bardzo. The comment is if you could speak to the lingering effects um, throughout you know, your life and our life, specifically how difficult this was to basically come out of the closet after many years, um, the promises with Uncle Maurice, um, Eva Beck, you know, your best friend and what that was like. If I could just speak to that as the lingering effects you know, from your experience. <laughs> to talk about the effect of on you in your life. What the coming to sort of bringing this forward in the present? Well, <laughs> she's got it. I have my butt on. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, the diary of my sister, since I never read it didn't have tremendous effect on me because I couldn't read it. My life was very happy that I found the United States and when they sang, God bless America, my mother cried. We found a home. We found a place that nobody was going to say, you dirty Jew. And so life became normal. And we hope it stays that way because it's changing again. 
And so life should be nice for everybody, whatever religion they want to keep. And that's why it's very important. I think that my sister's diary is known now, and maybe people will read, and maybe they will accept the tolerance in the world, because that, I think, is the most important thing we can find, and it's difficult to find. I just want to say that you heard what happened, but I lived it. I lived it as a child. I was 10 years old in November of 1938. And uh, I remember that suddenly two strange men entered my home, our apartment, into my room early in the morning, like, say, six or seven o'clock in the morning. They looked into my bedroom, proceeded to close the door, and leave. I didn't know how what had happened. I don't know how come these people came into our apartment and came into my room and whatever. Actually, I had no way to know at the time just how lucky my family was for well, these men had invaded our home but had done no harm. Other apartments in the same building where we lived had been totally destroyed by these Nazi men who came in and just vandalized it and, and vandalized the apartment and destroyed whatever they could and so threw things out the window. Lots of Jewish property was destroyed that night. As I walked to school that same morning, I saw how extensive the destruction was. All the stuff that had been thrown out into the street where I lived. And as there was a lot of debris, shards, broken glass scatt scattered all over the place. And I have never, never forgotten that. The synagogue where I attended um, normally had been set on fire and it was completely destroyed. But um, among the rubble, I don't know why I went back again and again to into this destroyed synagogue through the back door. One day I found on the floor a children's Torah. And this is now, this was 60, 70 years ago. And I have kept this as a very treasured memento of that time uh, of my life in, in Germany. All I can say now is it's just a memory. But Remembering that, and remembering and learning from what happened is a challenge to all of us because we must try to do more so that these things cannot happen again. Uh, again, I was a child, but I, I can only think of what my parents experienced. They were good German citizens. They were Germans. And now suddenly they were outcasts and they were enemies. I think it is, we try to stand up to do what is right. And maybe if perhaps more people had stood up for what was right, not just that day, not just the 10th of November, things wouldn't have happened in Germany. But being even as a child, I knew that it was with the Nazis practically impossible because anybody, anybody just said anything against it would be grabbed, taken to concentration camps, if not killed. So could it have been prevented? I don't know. 
But again, this is what my memory is as of, memory is as of today. Thank you. And I think that is a very meaningful and powerful note to end on. So thank you for joining us. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank we hope you have a very meaningful coming. visit to the museum. Yeah,